haven't seen you in a while. It's been a little while. It's good to see you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for giving all of us the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name is Eric DiMario. I live in Narragansett. I've been a lifelong resident of Rhode Island. Um, and in particular, before I address this issue, I just want to give a particular thanks to my own representative, Representative McEntee, for all of her hard work on getting this very uh, important bill hopefully passed into law. I'm going to be brief because there are many others that we have already heard from and that we hopefully will hear from that can better speak to these issues than I can. Um, I'm an attorney. The majority of my practice is focused on civil litigation. And through my work, I experience on a daily basis the power of our civil justice system. In many ways, uh, it can be the last refuge for justice. If this bill becomes law, it will unlock the doors of the civil justice system for many, many survivors of childhood sexual abuse that have found those doors closed for far too long. Um, the current statute of limitations, as we all know, is seven years. And that, in the legal sense, sounds like a long statute of limitations, but it is woefully insufficient to respond to the types, <clears throat> excuse me, the types of acts that we're dealing with in this situation. My wife is a licensed mental health counselor, and we've heard a lot from the mental health community this evening. She submitted some written testimony. She would tell you, others in her field would tell you, and the great weight of the research that's been done on this subject would tell you that the type of trauma and harm that these survivors have gone through, the nature of the relationships you commonly see between survivors and the perpetrators, and the and the extreme pressure on survivors to keep silent all support that a seven-year statute of limitations is just inappropriate for this type of conduct. Uh, neighboring states have recognized that, and increasing the statute of limitations to 35 years uh, is greatly supported by the data and the research that's been done on how long it takes survivors to come to terms with these types of conduct, or this type of conduct. Now, there are Opponents of this bill or bills like it that would suggest to you that a period of limitations of 35 years is too long, that it's not fair to the accused, that records are lost, that memories fade and witnesses die. In response to this, I would suggest to all of you that it is the perpetrators, and in many instances the enablers of those perpetrators that have benefited from this delay. It is certainly not the survivors of this type of conduct. The perpetrators of this type of conduct and the people that surround them and enable it have benefited for too long from silence and from the delay in these claims being brought to justice. They, didn't, they, they engage in this delay because they know that they have a clock that they can run out. And as has been talked about by some other witnesses in Rhode Island, it's a very short clock. They know that if they can run out that clock, justice delayed will eventually become justice avoided. As a lawyer, as a father, and as a human being, I cannot begin to comprehend the darkness of the thought process of anyone that is presented with reports of this type of conduct and then reaches the decision to not only shield the perpetrator from justice, but to actively enable that perpetrator to continue to abuse children. We now know that for decades, many institutions ranging from the church to schools and universities allowed this very pattern to play out. Known abusers were not only allowed to escape justice, but they were kept in places where they were enabled to abuse other children. These abusers, and more particularly, the people and institutions around them cannot now rightly claim that the passage of time from which they have greatly benefited for so many years should be a compelling basis to continue to deny justice to their victims. I would not have thought that you would need a legal disincentive to prevent covering up childhood sexual abuse, but apparently you do. And as we've heard from some of the other lawyers tonight, these organizations do not appear to have any interest in doing the right thing of their own volition, and it won't be until the legal community brings very great pressure to bear on them that you'll see real change. And hopefully that will mean that the next coach or teacher or priest 
who receives a report of this type of conduct will think first to call the police and not their superior. I'm aware that the Catholic Church in particular is opposed to this bill. I was raised in small parishes in Pawtucket and in Lincoln, and I know what it means to be a Catholic and a Catholic in Rhode Island. I've also read this bill. This bill is not anti-Catholic church. And if the Catholic Church perceives this bill to be anti-Catholic church, then it speaks more about the Catholic Church than it does the merits of this bill. I would urge the representatives in the House to take whatever steps they can to advance this bill to a vote before the full chamber. And I know many of you uh, from the legal community as well, and you all know, both as lawyers and as legislators, that the devil is in the details. And as some of the other witnesses have mentioned, I would urge you to pass this bill unedited and as written. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.